Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. So I'm going to get down on my knees in just a moment. I'm going to ask the, the Lord to be our teacher and the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. As we do, I want to invite you, if you're able to, would you join with me in standing as we prepare our hearts and our, and our eyes and ears to see and hear the Word of God and to receive it today? Let's go before the Lord in prayer today. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here. Lord, we're just so privileged that we get to come to church without fear of persecution and lift you high and magnify your name. Lord, what, a, what an honor it is. God, we don't take it for granted. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a particular man or woman or from the old or from the young or anything like that. God, we don't come to church for tradition or entertainment. We come to church to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ that's the senior leader of this church. And it's in the name of Jesus we ask. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be our counselor, would be our teacher. Guide us today. Show us the word of God as you would have us to hear and to see. Lord, I pray that it would be like a seed planted in a good and fertile ground as we walk out of this place. Lord, that we would magnify and glorify your name for the world to see because of what we have learned and what we have been taught. Lord, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with here. We don't think of ourselves ever as better than anybody else. Rather, we're co-laborers in the body of Christ. So, Father, we thank you for all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ today. Lord, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and our denominational brothers and sisters, all the various denominations. Lord, our local churches, churches like Harvest and the Grove. Lord, we thank you for churches like Sandals and uh, Water of Life. Lord, I ask that your hand would be upon the well and, and Emmanuel Baptist Ecclesia. Lord, I pray that you would bless victory and trinity. Lord, uh, new creation, abundant living, family, church. Lord, we thank you for all of our brothers and sisters, our Calvary chapels around uh, California and Southern California. Lord, we thank you, God, that you would bless them as we ask that you would bless us. And Lord, we thank you that we're all many members of the body of Christ working together to build your kingdom for your glory. And Lord, we pray that your kingdom come. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the Psalms. The 133rd Psalm. I really like this psalm. You know why I really like this psalm? It's got three verses. Those are the easy ones. You say, okay, you look at this and say, I can do this. I can read this. And Psalms 133 is what we're going to look at this morning. The subject, uh, the title of this morning is, is, is Unified. You see, this is the week after Christmas, and I thought as I was preparing and as the Lord had been uh, working on some things in my heart all the way back from, from the summer months thinking about this message. I was preparing and thinking about this, and as this, this weekend serves to be a transition. Oftentimes, it's Christmas has gone, and we're looking forward to the new year, looking towards the new years. Oftentimes, people are making resolutions or planning for what's going to happen in the next year and things that they're going to do or changes that they're going to make in their lives or whatever it might be. And I thought, as far as next week, we're going to have what we call kind of like a vision Sunday. We're going to talk about where we're going and some of the plans and some of the hearts of, of what the Rock Church is going through and what we're going to be talking about in 2015. And, and I want to encourage you also to remind you that we have a New Year's Eve prayer and praise service on Wednesday. We're going to just bring in the New Year's with, a, with the Spirit of God and, and, and look back at what we've done in 2014. And we're going to celebrate this next year. But as this period of transition of looking forward to it, I thought, how can we usher in this, this new year or, or prepare ourselves in the subject of unity or to be unified together? The Lord had impressed upon my heart. And in Psalms, the 133rd Psalm, verse number one, it says, Behold how good it is or how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. How pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Do you know who the brethren is? That's you. That's me. That's us together. Here the psalmist is saying, Behold how good it is for the brethren, for us, the family of God, to dwell, to be together and operate in unity. I really believe that if we're going to go somewhere in 2015, we've got to do this together as a family, in unity, working together for each other and with each other. And today I want to talk to you about that subject. I'm going to impress upon you what God has impressed upon me and um, take you through a thought process and a journey that I believe that the Lord has taken me on. And I want to start by just telling you a little story of a lesson that I had learned or an example that I had learned. I remember long ago uh, I had set out to hike to the top of the, uh, uh, the tallest mountain here in Southern California, Mount San Gregorio. It was my first time. It's the one that's covered in snow right now. My brother-in-law and my friend, we all set out to do that, and he had done it before, and, and so we followed his leading, and, and uh, we got on the trail late. You know, one of the things I really like to do is I like to go hiking and, 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 and be out in the wilderness or in the back country. I like to call it God's country. 
The reason I like that is I enjoy the solitude. I enjoy getting away kind of from the hustle and bustle of life. You know, no cell phones, no worries. You don't everybody, you know, I'm not looking at emails or updating Facebook. And you're just spending you and, and time. And I like to get out there. I pray and spend some time in solitude. And it's just a really neat experience. So we were going out there, and we're setting out on this trail, and we got out, we got to start later in the morning than we thought we would or we should have, and we got there about halfway. It's a nine-mile trip each way, so it's about a 19 or 18-mile trip, you know, round trip, and we got about halfway through going up to the summit, and my brother-in-law, we found this little game trail, game trails where rabbits and, and, and wild animals kind of coming back and forth, and they create their own little trail. You can see it's pressed down into the, into the, into the undergrowth of the, of the forest. And he comes to this game trail and he says, hey, guys, I know this. This is a shortcut. If we, if we follow this trail, it's going to go right up over this hill. And it's the direct route to the summit instead of this trail, which goes around and takes us the long way. And th that, let's take this way. It's a shortcut. And we're kind of like, you know, my friend and I, we didn't know any better. So we're like, okay, you've done this before. So there we go. We go press it on this game trail. Well, soon enough, the trail ended. And we found ourselves neck deep in chaparral. Chaparral is that really twiggy, sticky, thorny, uh, uncomfortable bushes and brushes about neck deep, about this high. We had lost sight of my brother-in-law. He was up ahead. And we're like, Stephen. And he called back, I'm here. We think we should turn back. And he come back, and he's like over the other ridge. No, it's just over this other ridge. And three hours we spent in this neck deep chaparral. You couldn't see anything. And we were in a valley, you couldn't see the sun anymore. We had grown concerned, no sight of a trail. And I learned the distance at that moment between solitude and isolation. <laughs> I go out seeking solitude. Solitude says, hey, I'm gonna take some time like Jesus in the garden and just kind of enjoy the time with me. Isolation is completely disconnected from everything else. And when we learned there, we were afraid. I mean, we were downright lost. No trail, no way to get back. Luckily, we remembered, thank you, Bear Grylls and, and the survival shows, that we remembered if you can find water, head down. Water leads to bigger water and heads to civilization. We followed, we followed the water, found the trail. And like smart guys, we decided, nah, we're going to go to the mountain anyways, instead of turning back after wasting three hours being lost. We made it to the summit of that mountain, and on the way back, it was about 8 o'clock. We were halfway through, right about the spot where we got lost again. And here's three young guys in shorts and T-shirts in the middle of the wilderness. No cell phone reception. All we had between us three guys was one power bar and a keychain flashlight. You know, you know what a keychain flashlight is? You know, it's one of those little tiny ones that, like, that has one LED that works on like the, the battery, you know, the hearing aid type battery. Three guys in the dark, pitch black exhausted, hungry, thirsty, our water was gone, and we are in the pitch black. Again, we felt isolation. You know, in the wilderness, when you don't have a light, when you don't have protection, when you don't have shelter, your mind starts playing tricks on you. We'd be walking on the trail, and what was that? Did you hear that? And it was like the Three Stooges walking in the trail. We couldn't bend our knees anymore. We're walking on the trail like this. And, and my wife had already called the police and, and the ranger station because I told her I'd be home by dinner. And we experienced true isolation, disconnected from the world around us. No way to reach out, nobody around us, no way to get in contact with anybody we knew. And isolation is a scary thing. You see, it's really easy for us to get isolated in our own lives. To get isolated mentally or to get isolated emotionally. To even become isolated within a crowd. You say, how is that possible? Well, maybe you've experienced isolation in your life. Maybe you've gotten lost and you've experienced that feeling of just saying, I don't know who to call or what to do or where to go. There's no answers. I don't know. How am I going to get out of this? Maybe you've been isolated because somebody hurt you. Or because you've gone through a, a pain in your life that you withdrew or disconnected or was severed from the world around you. Maybe you're isolated in church because some, somewhere at some point in your life, somebody did something or they burned you or you hurt something or you got hurt and you just disconnected and said, man, that's not for me. I'm just going to withdraw and back off. And you see, isolation is a dangerous thing. One, one, one author said that no man is an island to himself. I even heard a quote that said, a man that lives life to himself and for himself will be corrupted by his company. You see, God did not design you and I to be isolated from each other. 
And oftentimes what we find is that church, the building, can be one of the most isolated places. You can come, you can sit in a chair, you can face forward, you can listen to somebody speak for about 30 to 35 minutes, you can get in your car, you can go home. And you can do that week after week after week, year after year after year, and never know the person who's sitting beside you. You can get isolated. But you see, I know that you, I know that me, even if you, your personality uh, draws you to that kind of solitude, introverts, is there any, any, any introverts in the house? You kind of, you don't mind being alone every once in a while, right? Introverts unite at home alone, right? Okay. <laughs> Maybe your personality takes you to that where, you know, you enjoy a little bit of solitude. I can safely say that nobody, nobody wants to live a life of isolation. Because we need people in our lives. Just like the song says, we all need somebody to lean on. There it is, see? I remember during the Christmas uh, season, my kids are old enough to watch the movie, so we watched it. It's a family tradition. We were watching The Muppet Christmas Carol. One of the greatest Christmas movies, I say, of all times. We just had such a great time watching it. And I remember I was thinking about this because talking about the subject of isolation, of being disconnected, about being removed from those around you. It's a story of a man named Ebenezer Scrooge. And here this man is disconnected. He has no friends. He has no family. He has no cares except for his own self. Corrupted by his own company, one might say. And there he's visiting with the, the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And there he, they find themselves in the street. And there's some people talking about a man that had just died. And they were celebrating this man's death. They were glad. They were saying that somebody's gonna, they're going to have to pay people to show up to this man's funeral because nobody cares. Then the ghost took him to another room. And there they were watching. And he was looking at people that were collecting this dead man's garments and his clothes and his possessions. And they were talking about how he had fine things and nobody cared. And, and his sheets were still warm. And, and nobody shared that with him. And then as, as Ebenezer Scrooge's heart was broken because these people were glad for somebody to be gone, he asked this ghost, who is this man? And that ghost took him to a cemetery. And he began to realize he... The reality set in of who the man that he was looking at, this experience was he was talking about. And he says, who is this man in the, the ghost of Christmas yet to come points to, the, to the, the headstone in a cemetery. And he says, can the future be changed? Can my ways, if I stop, if I change, can this not be the future? And he begins to cry and the ghost just keeps pointing at the cemetery headstone. And he goes over there and he wipes the snow off of that headstone or that ledgestone. And his, there it is, his name, Ebenezer Scrooge. They were glad he was gone. He was an island to himself, isolated from the world around him. Nobody cared about him. He had made no impact on anybody's life. I know that for you, I know that for me, we all want, when the day comes that we die, for somebody to remember who we were, to have made a difference in somebody's life, to have left an impact here on earth, beyond our possessions, beyond the things that we collect, beyond the things that we like, to do something for somebody else. Why? Because God has ingrained that in each and every one of us. We need each other. And today I want to talk to you about the subject of being unified by saying this, that we are connected together through Jesus Christ. Remember how it said in Psalms 133, how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. You and I, we're family. You know, Christmas is one of the loneliest times of the year for certain people because they don't have family. Because maybe they've been hurt or they've been wounded or somebody that they loved is no longer with them. You see, you and I together and each other, we are family in Christ. But I want to take you one step further by saying that we're beyond just family. We're connected together in Christ. And I want to talk to you out of what the Bible says about this subject of being connected and talking about how it's dangerous and how you and I cannot be isolated in life or severed from everybody else. So if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter, Paul the Apostle begins to paint a really neat picture about you and I. Not only do we realize that we're family, but we begin to see something Different Now, if you've ever got some time or you've got some time to study this week, I encourage you, you ought to read 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. He talks about spiritual gifts and how people desire to want one over the other and so forth and so on. But then in verse number 13, he lays it down. He says, this is the greatest gift of all, love. And that's the love chapter we know. 
But in 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter, I'm going to read verse number 12 and we'll look at verse number 13, verse number 14. But 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter, it says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. You and I understand this. The body has many parts, many members, many individual functions and features. The fingers are different than the arm. The arm is different than the torso. The leg is different than the foot. The toes are different than the ear. The lungs are different than the heart, so forth and so on. The body is composed of many parts. And here Paul says, just as our bodies are composed of many parts, so is the body of Christ. So we see already that we are family, but now Paul begins to paint a different picture about you and I. Now, in verse number 13, he says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. For by one Spirit we were baptized into one body. Whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body, verse number 14, is not one member, but many. We live in a world... You know this. You've seen this. That is more polarized, more separated than it's ever been before. We live in a society that's literally tearing itself apart. We live in a world of labels, of identities, where we, we identify ourselves by the things that we like, by the things that we prefer, by the things that, that we are born into, by the names that we carry. We identify ourselves as black or as white or as Mexican or as Asian or whatever it might be. We identify ourselves as Christian or Catholic or Baptist or Lutheran. We live in a world that is literally more polarized than ever, a world that is tearing itself apart. I read an article just this morning about the U.S. finally ending the war in Afghanistan, bringing it to an official close. And the, the, the journalist that was writing it saying, 14 years ago as the United States entered into Afghanistan, the violence in Afghanistan is the same today as it is 14 years years ago. We live in a world where political correctness has not gained us anything. We live in a world where wars and battles and conflicts and stepping in and doing this and doing that has not gained justice nor peace. We live in a world of separation, or even this, isolation. We isolate ourselves to a group, to a label, like Paul the Apostle says, to the Jew, to the Greek, to the slave, or to the free. But you've got to see and got to understand that no longer are we identified by the labels that society has put on us. No longer do you and I identify ourselves by the name that we were born into, by the preference that we, that we have, or, or by, by saying likes, the things that I like and the things that I dislike. We're no longer associated that we have been given a new label, the body, been made to drink, been baptized into one body. I love how the message paraphrase describes this. I'll just read this to you. The, the second part or the, the last part of the 13th verse in, in, in that says this, the old labels that we once used to identify ourselves. Labels like Jew, like Greek, labels like slave or free. They're no longer useful. Why? We need something larger. You're no longer identified by the race that you belong to. You're no longer identified by the things that you like. You're no longer identified by the style in which you dress. You're no longer identified by the status in which you have in society. You're no longer identified by being smart or being uneducated, by being rich or by being poor. Those labels are no longer useful. We needed something bigger, more comprehensive. You and I are identified by the label of body. The body of Christ. That is who we are. That is our identity. That is what makes us up. Each and every one of us in this place, if you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you are now identified by being a member of the body of Christ. The sooner we grab a hold of this, the bigger our perspective of life becomes. It's no longer about our preferences. Well, I, I, I like this song, or I like that song. 
I like it when the church is darker. I like it when the church is brighter. I like it when, when this guy preaches. Or I like it when that guy preaches. I like it when, with this. Or I, I, No longer do we associate ourselves with us, but because we begin to realize that church is not just about us. We are the body. We are the, the, the people of God connected to Jesus Christ, baptized into his body. There are songs that we sing I don't like, but I know that somebody else in the body does. There are messages sometimes that we preach I don't want to hear, but I know that someone in the body does. And we got to learn and understand that we are members of the body of Christ. We're talking about the subject of being unified in unity. You see, the body is not about our preference. Church is not a building. It's not an institution. It's not a club. Church is people. That's what we are. You and I connected together in the body of Christ. That is what church is. So when we say, I'm going to church, it's not about going into the walls of a building. It's about getting connected with the body of Christ together. And I tell you, when we get a hold of this subject, when we get a hold of this idea, then we realize that God's not desiring uniformity, everybody liking the same thing, everybody looking the same way, everybody acting the same way, but rather God's desire is unity, many members of one body. Then all of a sudden our perspective begins to broaden. It's not a white church, praise God. It's not a black church. It's not a Mexican church or an Asian church. This is God's church. Why? Because we don't hold those labels anymore. We are God's body. And when we grab a hold of this, life begins to open. If you've got your Bibles, go with me now to Romans in the 12th chapter. Paul takes it another step further. This is like the 12s. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Now Romans, the 12th chapter. If you've got some time to study this week, I encourage you to go to Romans, the 12th chapter. Really great section of scripture here as well. Romans in the 12th chapter. Paul the Apostle says this. I'm going to read in verse number 4. Paul the Apostle says this. He says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. Verse number 5. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Think about that for a moment. Paul says, we have many members in our body. Not all of them serve the same. Not all of them are the same. They don't look the same. They don't act the same. Now he says, just like your body has parts that do different functions, so does the body of Christ. We're all playing a role in the body of Christ. But I love this. He says that we're connected to Christ in the body. We get that. We understand that. Praise God, I'm in the body of Christ. But did you know that, look at the statement he says here, and individually members of one another. Did you know that the person sitting to your left, to your right, to the front of you or to behind you, that they're not just family, brethren. Now, they're literally connected as a body part. Just like the heart relies on the lungs, and the lungs rely on the brain, and the brain relies on, on the different parts of the, just like the fingers rely on the arm and the arm relies on the torso and, and the toes rely on the foot and the ear relies on the eyes. We are members of each other. Each of us has a particular and peculiar feature that God has ingrained and created us for. There are some of you in this place, you are very serious, very calculated. God made you that way. There are some of you in this place, you're a little quirky, a little different, a little, a little off the rocker. God made you that way. Because you see, God's desire is that there are many members of the body, and not all members do the same thing, but the body is better together than it is apart. So when our eyes begin to open and we begin to see that church is not just about me, my experience, what I need, I need to give, I need to take, take, take from the church, but also the church is about my body, my family, those who are connected about me, then all of a sudden our perspective begins to open up and life begins to happen. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, a martyr in World War II for the German church, and he says the church is only a church when it exists for people. 
You and I together, we are the body of Christ. I love how Paul the Apostle is, describes us as many members, different functions. I'm going to read to you Romans, the 12th chapter, the 4th through 6th verse, in the message paraphrase. He says this, he says, In this way, we're like various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. Look at this. But a chopped off finger or a cut off toe wouldn't amount to much, would it? So we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body. Let us go ahead and be what we are made to be without enviously, pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something that we're not. See, God's desire for you is to fulfill your role in the body of Christ. God made you, you, so that you would be you. So let's not look to somebody else and say, well, I, I got to be like that, or I got to sound like that, or I got I to act like this, or look like this. God made you, you. And we're all many members of the body of Christ, working together to build His kingdom for His glory. And God's desire is that we would come together with our different features, our different functions, the serious and the quirky, the cool and the weird, all together coming and serving our purpose in the body of Christ because the body is better together than it is apart. Amen, amen. This is a world that we live in that has everything in it to tear you away from the body of Christ. There are so many things in this world to take you out of the body, to isolate you. We can even say it like this, since Paul said a cut-off finger or a cut-off toe wouldn't amount to much. There is so much in this world that is out to isolate you, to cut you off from the body of Christ. Let's not be naive about it. Jesus said that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. To steal your position, to kill your purpose, and to destroy the body. But Jesus said, I have come to give you life. Life as a body part. The blood flowing and, and operating in its purpose. Fulfilling what it has. Has anybody ever had a limp or a broken member of their body? A finger or a toe? Or cut themselves or been injured in some form or fashion? I have a broken toe right now. You know, I can't wait till I can touch my toe again. Because when the body, when a one member of the body is hurting, the rest of the body feels it. Why? Because God desired, created us to be connected to one another in the body of Christ, not just to Jesus. Let me say it like this, since Paul said talking about that toe. Body parts look and function better when they're connected. Amen to that one? As a matter of fact, I have right here a knife. To demonstrate this point, I've got myself a good sharp knife. Now all I need is a volunteer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know nobody would want to sacrifice that. So instead, I have prepared for you an illustration. Body parts are better connected than they are apart. Here I've got this uh, little drapery and I've got some goodies for you. I've got a hand. These are some fingers right there. That's pretty good right there. Those look good. I like this one. This one's my favorite. That's an ear. Looks pretty good in that formaldehyde, right? How about this one? This one. There's a foot for you. Yeah, they need to clip their toenails before they put it in there. Body parts look and function better when they're connected. What good does a hand in a jar do? See, God's desire for each and every one of us is to be a part of the body of Christ, connected to Jesus Christ, but not just to Jesus, to one another. We're members of each other. Now, for those of you, let me just set your mind at ease. They're rubber. 
They're not real. But you see that when you look at your hand or when you look at your ear, connected, you don't say, that's disgusting. But when you look at a hand or a foot in yellow formaldehyde type water, you say, that's gross. Why? Because body parts are better. They look better and they function better when they're connected. Your responsibility, your responsibility is to be connected to the body of Christ. Nobody can make you. Nobody can force you. Nobody can take the hand out of the jar of isolation and stick it to the body and say, you're a part of us. That's yours. But let me tell you something. The body is better off with you than it is without you. And you are better off in the body than you are outside of the body in a jar. You might say, Pastor Luke, what on earth are you talking about? What does this have to do with me? Here it is. You and I are all members of the body of Christ. We all have a purpose. We all have a feature. You were designed for a purpose. You have a call, a reason to live. Remember that Ebenezer Scrooge, people remembering him when he died? God put upon you a purpose, the position in the body of Christ, and you are better connected than you are apart. You may say, I don't feel like I'm worth anything. I don't feel like I have any value. As a part of the body, I'm one of those parts that nobody knows about. Let me tell you something. God has put a purpose on you. You are worth something. You are valuable. You may not have any family, but you have a body to be connected to. Because body parts look and function better when they're connected. In 2015, we're going somewhere, this church. When I say this church, this building's staying here. But these people, we're going somewhere. And we're better together than we are apart. And we need you and you need each other to be connected in the body of Christ. You know, I was talking about resolutions. I think resolutions are actually a pretty good thing. I used to say my resolution was to not make resolutions anymore. But you know, it's a good thing to examine your life and to say, this is something I want to improve. This is something that I don't need to do anymore. This is something that I want to cut out, or this is something that I want to add on in my life. You know what happens with resolutions is you break them. About an hour into making a resolution, you forget it. But you know what? Rome wasn't built in a day. Don't give up because you didn't follow through the first day. Get back up. Dust yourself off. Keep going. This year, I want to challenge you to make resolutions, but not just about yourself. Not just about going to the gym. Not just about getting more fit or losing some weight or whatever it might be. I want to challenge you to make a resolution to be your part in the body, to do your part in the kingdom of God. Here it is. If there's one thing for you to take away from, here's what I want to ask you to do this week. Pray for 2015, for this next year. Pray for what God's going to do. And secondly, to pray for your part in the body. I believe with all of my heart that if you go before God and you say, God, this year I want to see you move. God, this year I want to see things like I've never seen before. And Lord, I'd ask in you to reveal to me your position, your heart for me. God, give me the opportunity to be a part of the body I believe with all of my heart. God so desires for you to be connected. He'll answer your prayer. But it starts by making the effort. Nobody can make you be a part of the body, but you got to choose. And I want to challenge you. This year, go out on a limb. Try something that you've never tried. Do what you've never done. Maybe it's time to get connected in the church. In January, you'll see it's our Volunteer Appreciation Month. You'll see all sorts of different opportunities to get involved. Maybe it's time to go help in the children's ministry or volunteer with the youth or come out on a, and help in the food distribution center. Go out with the street teams or whatever it might be. Become an usher. Get connected. Join a small group to meet somebody in church. This year, go out on a limb. 
Open yourself out. Stop the isolation of your heart and open yourself up to be connected to one another in the body of Christ. And I'll tell you what, your life will never be the same. You say, I don't know what my part is. How can I do this? Pastor, look, you're up there ministering. I come to hear you, or I come to hear Pastor Jim, or I come to... Every part plays a different feature. Maybe that you're talented and gifted in music, and you need to join the team. Maybe it's that you have a gifting to pray. Whatever it is your part is, God has given you the ability to fulfill your place. I remember I had a friend that I knew that they were kind of going through something. I hadn't talked to him in a long time. Somebody that had been disconnected with, and I just knew I'd heard by the, from the grapevine that they had been experiencing some hardships in their life, and I thought, all right, I'm going to call them. I'm going to, you know, just let them know I'm here for them if they want to go out to lunch or whatever it might be. And, you know, you're kind of going through this scenario. I'm worried they're going to just kind of let, let me have it, like all the, and I'm going to be like, oh, my goodness, your life is awful. So I'm preparing myself, and as I call them, remember I was like, you know what I'm talking about. I got their answer machine. I was like, praise God. And all I just said is, hey, I just wanted you to know that I was thinking about you. I want you to know that I was praying for you and that I'm here for you if you need anything. You know, I never heard back from that friend. Months later, they contacted me on social media. And they said to me, you know, you don't even know what I was going through that time. But your call, just your voicemail, is all I needed to know that I was not alone, that somebody was thinking about me. That was my part in that time. Maybe your part is just to smile at somebody or to tell somebody that Jesus loves you. Maybe your part is to shake somebody's hand. Maybe your part is to get involved. But whatever it is, seek God for your purpose. And I tell you what, I believe that God will tell you and he'll fulfill it and your life will never be the same. I want to finish by reading what Paul the Apostle says. I'm going to read it out of the, again out of the message paraphrase. Where did I put my Bible? Thank you. <laughs> it's missing. Continuing on in Romans, the 12th chapter, look what Paul says. He says, if you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful, don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. Look what he says. He says, love at the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Listen to this. Practice playing second fiddle. When we begin to realize church isn't a building, an institution, or a club. Church is people. When we begin to realize that we're not just in the body of Christ, that we're connected to each and every one of our, uh, the person next to us in the body of Christ together, reliant upon each other, our perspective begins to broaden. Don't look to somebody else and compare yourself and say, i got to look like that or i got to get involved here to be involved. Do what God created you to do. Amen. And I'll tell you what, your life will never be the same. We're going somewhere in 2015. And when we gather together in unity, many different, some serious, some quirky, some weird, some cool parts of the body, when we gather together in unity, many parts, different functions, serving the, the same purpose, I'll tell you what, we're going to go places we've never been. We're going to see things we've never seen. I can't wait for 2015 because I know God is going to do something. And here's what I say to you. There's so many opportunities to get involved here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. But we can't handle 20,000 volunteers, which means that there are some of you, your position in the body of Christ is out ministering to those who are outside of this building to get involved, to look at, some of you to look inside and some of you to look outside, to fulfill your purpose. I'll tell you what, God will do that. And how do you do that? Start by praying for 2015 and your place in the body of God. 
This next January, we're going to introduce some things. We're going to have a fast in the month of January. We'll invite you to join with us. And you can choose to fast food or a meal or do the Daniel fast, and we'll talk about that in the next week or so. We'll invite you, but I want to encourage you to join with us and let's seek God this year more than we ever have. Let's be more unified as the body of Christ than we've ever been. And I'll tell you what, God will do things that we have never seen before. Amen? Amen. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? Praise God. Listen, really quickly, I just want to take a moment. I want to first ask everybody, just give me a moment more of your attention. Please don't get up, don't leave. Keep, uh, keep your attention focused on what I'm about to say because it's so important that you grab a hold of what we're going to talk about today. I want to challenge you by asking you a question. I know I've probably challenged you a couple of times already this morning. I'm going to challenge you one more time. I'm going to ask you this question. Nobody will know this answer except you and God. The question is this. If you were to leave today and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? It's a really simple question. But you know, nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. Nobody around you, nobody that you know, it's an answer between you and God and you and God alone. Today I want to talk to you about your answers. Because you see, how you answer that question has a lot to say about your position and relationship with God. So today I want to ask you, have you said, well, I think so, I hope so, I want to. Where do you see that in the Bible? You see, nowhere in the Bible are you going to find that you can hope, think, want, wish, or will your way into heaven. Like if you have the most positive outlook on life, you're going to get there. Nowhere in the Bible will you find that. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents took you to church as a child, because you were baptized or christened as a baby, because you went to Sunday school or catechism classes or something like that as a kid, that you're going to get to heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church. Here you are today, listening to the pastor preach, doing your thing. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you go to church, you're going to get to heaven? You know you can't get to heaven because you call yourself a Christian? Because you've given yourself the title? You know, that's like me saying, I'm a, I'm a Dodger. I'm going to be a part of the Dodgers team and, and go put on a Dodger uniform and sit in the Dodgers dugout. You know that I'm not a part of the Dodgers team even if I call myself a part of the team. And they're going to take me out of that dugout and lock me up. You can't give yourself a title and expect it to be good enough. You see, the only way you and I can get to God's heaven is God's way. And God's standard for entrance is perfection. But the problem is, is that we have all sinned, the Bible says, and fallen short of the glory of God. So no matter what we do, no matter how good we are, but I thought good people go to heaven. I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I, I don't do bad things. I, I've done more good in my life than I've done bad. I try to help out my fellow human being. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're a good person, you're going to go to heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you do good things or because you help out other people that you're going to get to heaven? But we think that way. You know, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, is like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough. The Bible says over and over and over again in the New Testament that we're not saved by our works. So how do we get there? The only way to get to God's heaven is God's way. And Jesus Christ is that way. Jesus says these words. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So today I want to offer you God's way. Jesus, in the book of John, was speaking to a man by the name of Nicodemus, a religious leader, a man who memorized scripture, a man who did good things, a man who, who lived the right way of life. He was a good person. And as they're talking about the subject of eternal life, you would think that Jesus would say to Nicodemus, man, you just keep on going. You're going to get into heaven. But Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. There it is, God's way. Listen, it's not what you think about it. It's not what Hollywood or society or cultures made it out to be. Born again has always meant the same thing in the heart and the eyes of God. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart, you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know and believe that Jesus is the Son of God, yet they're not on their way to heaven. It's more than simple mental assent or carnal knowledge of who Jesus is. I can say it like this. I know who the president is, but I don't know him. You could know who Jesus is, but miss out on knowing him. And God wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. Let me again prove it to you by showing it to you in the Bible. Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to the church. We heard about that today, you and I. Jesus says to the church, I'm coming back. And he says, when I come back, he says he'd rather find us hot or he'd rather find us cold. Because if he finds us lukewarm, he says he'll vomit us from his mouth. Whew. Shocking statement out of the mouth of Jesus. And what he's saying is that 
lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. And they're going to be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm? Let's discuss that. Let's define that. Today, lukewarm simply means this in your relationship, that you're kind of up, kind of down, kind of in, kind of out, floating around, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. Not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. Listen, let me respect you enough. Let me honor you enough. Let me uh, love you enough to tell you the truth. If that's you in this place, you're not going to make it. God forgive us in American churches that we've watered the message down so much because we've been interested in the number of people in seats more so than we've been interested in the condition of the people that are in those seats, the condition of their souls. But more importantly, I respect God enough to tell you the truth. Jesus Christ is the only way for you and I to meet God, to live a life everlasting and a life of abundance here on earth. Jesus said that I have come to give you life, give it to you more abundantly. God tells us, the Bible tells us that the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. God loved you so much he gave you a free will choice to choose to accept or reject the gift of Jesus. Today I want to offer to you that choice. In just a moment I'm going to do something. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. And I'm going to go bang. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to clap my hands. And what I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to do something bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand, you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give God my heart. Pastor Luke, today, I want to give God my life. I want, I want to follow after Jesus. You see, Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. He says, but if you deny me, I'll deny you before my Father. Today, the choice is yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way in. It's your choice. He loved you so much that he sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, to die a beaten, bloody mess, to hang naked on a cross for the world to see, to bear our sin and shame so that we could be reunited and connected with God. Today I want to offer to you that gift of salvation, to give you the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ in your heart and in your life. And when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to pop your hand and say, man, if I raise my hand, I might be embarrassed. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? The decision is yours, yours alone. Nobody will make you. Nobody can force you. It's your choice. But I believe you're smart. I believe that the Spirit of God is speaking to you right now. And I believe today is a divine appointment. You've had doctors and dentists and DMV appointments. Now it's a divine appointment between you and God. So who should raise their hands? If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life, for just a moment, if that's you, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll go forward together from there. Who should raise their hands? Maybe you did this as a child in a youth group or at a harvest crusade. Maybe you prayed that prayer, but you never really followed through. If that's you, in just a moment, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Who should raise their hands in this place? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your, th your own thing instead of God's thing, been running from God instead of to God, hey, you've been playing games with God. Been a Christian on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, you're doing your own thing. Come on, today is the day for you to get connected into the body of Christ. No longer isolated, but now joined into the body of Christ. This is your day. Today is the day of your salvation. Whether you're in the front row or the back row, you guys in the family rooms, I can see you through the windows. Whether you're out there in the foyer or you hear the sound of my voice, wherever you're at, this is your moment. This is your time. When I count to three, I'm going to pop my hands together. If that's you, pop your hand up. I don't care if you've been in this church for one hour or 25 years. That does not matter. What matters is the condition of your heart and the condition of your soul and your relationship with Jesus. And today is the day for you to solidify with that and go forward and accept the gift of Jesus Christ through eternal life and abundant life here on earth. It's your choice. Today I'm going to count it. You ready? All across this auditorium from the front row to the back row, wherever you're at, you at home watching on the live stream, if that's you right now, hey, get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three. If that's you, get ready to pop your hand up. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. Let me see your hands in this place today. You popping your hand up. All right, I see one right over there. Thank you. Anybody else in this place today? Anybody else? You serious? Anybody else in this place? Where are we at? Where? Give me a little wave over there. Oh, okay, I see a two over there. Praise God. Three, four, five, six. Now I got you. Okay, well, you, you, let's, come on. If that's you in this place, I got you. Six wise people. I got you guys back there. Seven back there in the back. I got you. Seven wise people. Eight wise people over there. Praise God. Anybody else? You say, man, I wonder if I should. Right over here, nine. All right, praise God. Nine wise people. Anybody else? You say, man, I wonder if I should. Hey, this is your moment. This is your time. Ten, I see you, my man. Anybody else? Say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on, quit playing games with God. Today is the day for you to get connected. A hand in a jar does no good, but a connected body part looks and functions a lot better. Today's your day. Anybody else today? Ten wise people. Anybody else? I'm going to close it down. I'm going to conclude the service right now. 
Anybody else today? Well, praise God for 10 wise people. Hallelujah. All right, 11. Hallelujah. Well, here's what we're going to do. All 10 of you, 11 of you that raised your hand, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have. Hey, it's not too late. Here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, we're all going to stand. As we stand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, I want to do this. Now it's time to follow through, and we're going to do that together. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. If you came with somebody, say, hey, come with me. Or if you brought somebody, say, hey, I'll go with you. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get into the aisle, and come meet me right here in the altar. We're going to change destinies together right here, right now. So come on, let's all stand together. If that's you in this place, come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Nobody leave at this time as they're coming forward. If that's you, come on, out of your seat, out of your chair, come meet me right here. We're going to change destinies together. Come just as you are. Won't you hear? guys came. Listen, you, I want to lay something heavy on you. Can I do that? You are making the best decision a human being can make. Oh my goodness. You know, that means you're really smart. Really cool. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. You're going to get bored again. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy waving at you right over here? His name's Pastor Joel. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to take you guys right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Listen, I'm as weird as you're going to get, right? I have got body parts in jars, okay? You made it through me. He's going to take you guys right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer, okay? You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by making Jesus the Lord and Savior. We'll say it like this, the leader of your life. He's going to give you a free booklet, real simple reading. It's called Welcome to Your Destiny. helps point you in the right direction. As you walk out of this place, you say, what do I do next? We're going to help set you in that right direction. The last thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back. Hang out with us. Meet a friend. We'll get you connected here at the church. We'll get you connected like we're talking about. A friend, somebody that will sit with you right here at church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee before service. Teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in your new position in God's body. So if you would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.